Welcome to worship this morning. Wherever we are, we know the Holy Spirit is with us and encourages us to open our hearts and minds to our great God, creator of heaven and earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in our days of trouble, we call out to you. The psalmist tells us, you are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love. Thank you for your presence. You reach out your hand and call us to come to you. Lord, you encourage us to spread our deepest, darkest personal troubles before you, and you comfort and counsel those who put their trust in you. When we count our blessings and name them one by one, you rejoice with us and raise us up. We need you, our God. We want to walk with you along the path you have prepared for each one. Father, we come now to ask your forgiveness. When fear overwhelms us and pushes us around and we forget your promises, when we are selfish and spiteful and cringe in dark corners and forget whose we are and how you care for us, forgive us, Lord, and lead us into your light. We pray for believers all over the world, many facing terrible persecution for their faith. And we ask that you give us all courage to speak and act in the power of the Holy Spirit, to stand with each other as the apostles did and tell the good news like Peter with bold urgency. Thank you for your saving grace, which is freely available to everyone through Christ Jesus. You do not wait till we have cleaned ourselves up or looking respectable or acting more holy but you come searching for your lost sheep. You show us the chains which weigh us down and you show us the true freedom and joy of living for others instead of ourselves. Thank you for lighting the way. Thank you for your living word and we pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And this morning I'm doing the reading from today's Gospel, from the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 24 to 31. A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household, so do not be afraid of them. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. And even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. This is the word of the Lord to be treasured in thankfulness. And now I'd like to welcome Johnson to bring his message for us this morning. Thank you. Uh, good morning to you, everyone. We just want to thank you for listening to the message. Uh, I just want to thank Velda for the prayers and the Bible readings. 
Thank you so much. God bless you. Uh, today my theme is Stop Being Afraid. Stop Being Afraid. Uh, Jesus instructed to his disciples prior to their first mission continuing today's gospel reading. He has been telling them about all the dangers and hardships they may have to put up with and ends by saying, what do you expect? A disciple is not greater than his teacher. If the world gives me a bad time, it will give you one too. So what does Jesus do? Sell them life insurance? Give them bulletproof vests? Teach them how to defuse conflict? Hardly. Instead, he says, don't ever be afraid of your enemies and critics. Even though it's not obvious now, the truth will come out finally. So speak up, shout it out, and stand and deliver the message of God. We don't want to be heroes, especially not religious ones. It's all we can do to get into church on Sundays, and we are supposed to be shouting the word of God from the housetops. No way. We are afraid. But Jesus doesn't quit. Stop being afraid. That's the force of the verb. Stop being afraid. Not just once, but always. Stop being afraid of people who can kill the body, but not the soul. Stop being afraid. So the point is, people can hate us only temporarily because life comes from God. Even if they kill us, God, the author of life, will raise us. Think about it. Because he's the one who owns life. Even if they kill us, God is in control, he's in charge. Don't fear people. For fear God, the one who can kill both body and soul. That is the only person we can fear in verse 28. This is the greatest loss. Eternal separation from God, from Christ, and from hope. Spiritual death is the loss that cannot be measured. And the doom that should be avoided at all costs. The ways of Jesus in verse 28 evoke memories of St. Lee John Knox, whose epitaph reads, Here lies one who feared God so much that he never feared the face of any man. I would like that also to be written on my grave as well. Contrary to the popular opinion, Jesus is saying that the voice of the people is not the voice of God. We worry my way too much about what other people say or think of us and far too little about what God thinks of us. Yes, but we know this is true. We have heard it before, but it is easier than said than done. So what's the solution? More advice? More instruction? That's what we would expect. But Jesus is not only a teacher. He is the revelation of God, though he doesn't stop being a good teacher when he opens a window into God. He says, aren't sparrows the most common and cheapest bird around? Yet not one of them dies apart from your father. In Matthew 10, verse 29. Who? And what about you? Jesus asked. God even knows every hair on your head. So stop being afraid. You are of much more value than any sparrow. Which means you are of much more value than anything you may think of. Because God cares for you. He knows what is troubling you. He knows what is deep down in your heart. So you need not be afraid. Isn't that amazing? God knows everything that we go through and nothing that happens to us escapes him. Even if we die, it doesn't happen apart from God. Even if we seem totally abandoned, even if our prayers don't seem to be answered, even if everything seems hopeless, God knows and God cares. If that is the case, we can stop being afraid. So not being afraid isn't something that we can accomplish. As long as we think it is, we will still be afraid. Of other people, of death, of circumstances, real or imaginary. But as Jesus reveals it, we can stop being afraid because of a promise. A promise that God who watches over the commonest of birds will also take care of us. When someone makes a promise to you, what do you have to do? If your grandparents write their will and say that when they die, you will get the farm. What do you have to do? Be nice to them. Work real hard. Why? 
They have already plumbed through the farm. What do I have to do? Is the wrong response to a promise. It doesn't make sense. If you find out you are going to inherit something, you say, wonderful. Thank you. Out of the blue, you have an, a retirement plan. Suddenly, the future doesn't seem so uncertain. You've got things now which you've never had. Most of our life is lived not according to the logic of promise, but in asking and answering the question, what do I have to do? If I want to graduate from school, what must I do? If I want to get promoted, what must I do? If I want to be respected, what must I do? Nothing wrong with that. Those are all important things that we can work on. Most of life is like that. What goes wrong in, is when we try to put that logic of what do I have to do into our religious life. What do I have to do to get God to care about me? Stop being afraid. No, 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 no. no. It's the other way around. God does care about you, so you don't have to be afraid. You don't need to be afraid. The response to a demand to graduate from school, to support your family, to be someone others respect, is to do something. You are doing something. So the response to a promise is altogether different. The response to a promise is to celebrate, rejoice, give thanks because someone else had done something for you. You are not working for the family you have been promised. It is your grandfather who has worked for you. So you need to rejoice, you need to celebrate because the farm is already worked for. So you are just receiving. So God knows every hair on your head. God even cares about sparrows and you are of much more value than any sparrow. God will take care of you. That's a promise. You don't have to be afraid. Never. You don't have to be afraid. Yes. But who can believe this? Who can live without fear? Maybe only fools live without fear. We are suspicious even of the promises we are given. We are always hearing promises that are not even kept. Our, our grandparents may promise to leave us the farm when they die, but who is to say they won't go bankrupt and lose the farm before that? Husbands and wives promise to be faithful to each other until death, but half the time they can't keep these promises. We see divorces happening. Our life experience teaches us to be suspicious of promises. Not because people who make promises don't have good intentions, but because they are fallible, mortal, sinful human beings like us can't always keep our promises. We can't always keep our promises. I promise that I will repay you that money if possibly I can. I will be there promptly at noon if I don't have a car accident. I will finish remodeling the house if I don't die first. All of our promises have an if in them. If I can, if I don't have an accident, if I don't die, we can't help it. It has nothing to do with bad intentions. It is the way we are. We cannot make promises without conditions, without ifs, because that's who we are. I'll get married when I have enough money. I'll do this if I have got this. So there are always ifs which are conditional. Yet Jesus made incredible far-reaching promises. Not only about God knowing every hand or our hands and promising to care for us, but also remember some of the others today. Today you'll be with me in paradise. He told that to the thief who was hanged on the cross. I go to prepare a place for you. Know that I am always with you. He told his disciples in John 14. I tell you, your sins are forgiven in the, in the Beatitudes. Those who mourn will be comforted. The meek will inherit the earth. The pure in heart will see God. And so forth. But when Jesus was crucified, these promises seemed to be all cancelled out. He had failed. When they saw Jesus Christ on the, on the cross, life just turned dark to them. It turned gloomy. They thought, oh, this is the end of everything. But that was not it. He was just 
a dreamer, according to them. One more idealistic prophet making promises he couldn't keep. Even his disciples no longer followed him. In the accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they are nowhere to be seen at the crucifixion. All of them have deserted and fled in Mark 14, verse 50. And Peter denied even knowing Jesus. He said, I don't even know this man. I don't know him. So, you can't live on promises alone. This would seem to say. Yet the gospel of salvation is nothing but promises. The gospel is always a word about what will be the case forever. A word that opens the future to us. That frees us from being afraid. That is what is in the gospel. If you read the Bible, it's full of promises. So we need to hold on on those promises because those are the promises right from God. Those are the promises God is giving to us. Is the gospel all a dream? Then, is it just an illusion? Male as possible, helpful fiction? Something to help us die more serenity? No. It would be if Jesus' death were the end of the story. For us, death is the end of the story. We cannot make unconditional promises because the threat of death means that we can never be sure of keeping our promises. But God raised Jesus. God made sure that Jesus could keep his promises. He raised Jesus so that now we can hold on Jesus' promises because Jesus conquered death. He conquered death. So his promises are true. Even death, our own death will not keep us, Jesus, from keeping the promises he makes us in the Bible. Because we die with him and we'll be raised with him. That's a promise. And it's the best basis for our hope in all our other promises. We know that even if we die today, we will resurrect with him. So that's a promise. He has told us, even the, the sparrows don't fall to the ground apart from God and the Father, and we are of greater value than many sparrows. Therefore, it is the case, as Jesus says, that everyone who acknowledges me before others, I also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. That's a promise. But we can even mess that up if we look at it through our old eyes of experience rather than seeing it in the light of the death and resurrection of the one who said these words. We can wrongly understand these words to be telling us that if we acknowledge or confess Christ, then you bless us by acknowledging us to God. But Jesus is talking to his disciples who already have been confessing their faith in him. He is saying to them and to all who follow him that they will never be laid down because he himself will acknowledge them before God. That's a promise. One commentator translated this verse, every person who stands up for me in front of others, I will stand up for that person in front of my Father in heaven. It is that sort of rock-solid guarantee, a promise won through the fires of crucifixion that enables us to stop being afraid of people and circumstances and shout the gospel from the housetops. Fear of God as we know God through Christ bestows fearlessness of people and circumstances that might otherwise cause us to lose faith. And the Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Not the fear of people, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. We need to understand that. The final verse is a summary spelling out of the reverse. If we deny Jesus, if we say with Peter, I don't know him. I don't know this man. In Matthew 26, verse 27, 72. And the, even swear to drive home the point, then Jesus will also say, he doesn't know us. No one will be forced into the kingdom. Even that is a promise. Although it must be understood in plight of Peter's bitter weeping when he realized that he has done and the subsequent word of the angel at the tomb to be sure to include Peter in the news that Jesus is risen. In Mark 16, verse 7. Verse 7. And the marvelous account of Jesus' threefold resurrection of Peter. And after the resurrection, Peter, Peter, do you love me? If you love me, feed my sheep. Which means, even Peter, though he had denied Jesus, at the end, he gained his relationship with Jesus. Today, that same crucified and risen Lord is in our midst, allowing us to stop being afraid because of the powerful love of God on which the promise is based. Even the hairs of your head are counted. 
you are of more value than many sparrows. Even the hair of your head is counted. You are of more value. You are important. You are somebody. When God sees, he sees his own image. So you are very important. You are not a nobody. You are somebody created in the image of God. So the promise continues in the blessed sacrament as we hear Jesus saying that this bread is my body given for you. This wine is my bloody shed for you. So we receive Christ in the bread and wine because his promises, he must meet us there. So when we receive, we are in fellowship with God as we receive the Holy Communion. So in the sacrament, the promise is visible and the touchable and feelable and testable. Take it, take and drink. As we do this in the remembrance of him, we can stop being afraid. Amen, church. We need to know that Christ is permanent with us. He cares for us. In this book, Mystery, E. Stanley Jones observes that early Christians were absolutely fearless in the face of terror. They turned threats into testimonies. They turned beatings into blessings. They turned lies into light. How did they do it? They did it because they were totally surrendered to God and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And they were able to do that. I say to you today, let us face our fears with faith. Surely it is God who saves us. Let us trust him and not be afraid. Yes, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for God is with me. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. There is no fear in love, because perfect love casts out fear. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no pain, for the former things have passed away. Fear not, for God is there. God is there. Amen to that church. We ought not be afraid of anything. In fact, people have given fears names so that they try to calm them. Fear of heights, fear of darkness, fear of light, fear of cars, fear of mobile phones. We have given them names so that maybe we can be calmed by those things. But I'm saying, fear not. God is in control. God is in charge. He's in control of your life. He cares for you. Just surrender your life to God and God will take care of your life. May the good Lord help you as you move through this Christian journey. As you are moving every day, knowing that God is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You are God's child. Very important than the sparrows out there. Very important than any animal you may think of. Very important than any creation you may think of. You are important in God's eye. You are a child of God. May the good Lord bless you as you continue to move in this Christian journey. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. Father, as we are gathered in our homes, we praise and worship you. We are all different with different hopes, different needs, different experiences. Father, we are gathered as your family. Thank you, thank you for inviting us into this Christian family that is bigger than we imagined, forever growing. Thank you for valuing each one of us. You call us not to fear so that we bring our pain to God. Do not fear to bring your doubts to God. Do not fear to bring your lack of confidence to God. Do not fear to bring your worst as well as your best to God. Do not fear to bring your memories and your dreams to God, your hopes and your anguish. God knows you and loves you. God will never give up on you. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. Lord Jesus, you knew that family life wasn't easy. We pray for our families, for all the joys and frustrations. We pray for all families suffering today through the COVID virus. For those who are in relationship completely broken. We pray for those who have moved from their homes. 
who have their, left their jobs because of coronavirus. Father, we pray for those who have lost relatives, friends during this period. For we know that you are God. You are able to comfort us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, I would want to ask Velda to come and pray for the offerings. Amen. Thanks, everyone, for, for being faithful and putting in your offerings. And we'll pray now over those offerings. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything that you have given us. And we pray that you will use these small tokens of our thankfulness in the growing of your kingdom, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us receive grace. May God, who cherishes every sparrow, who goes in each of every lost land, who embraces every lonely child, who dries every tear and holds every hand, guide you, sustain you, and enrich you, your life. And may, knowing that you are valued, Be your joyful song today and always. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen.